The Reef by Edith Wharton. Dramatised for radio by Penny Lester. Unexpected obstacle. Please don't come till 30th, Anna. All the way from Charing Cross to Dover, the train had hammered the words of the telegram into George Darrow's ears, rattling them out like a discharge of musketry, shaking them like the dice in some game of the gods of malice. And now, as he emerged from his compartment at the pier and stood facing the windswept platform and the angry sea beyond, they leapt out at him as if from the crest of the waves. Unexpected obstacle. Please don't come till 30th. Anna. She had put him off at the very last moment, a fact that shed an ironic light on the idea that there had been any exceptional warmth in the greeting she had given him after their twelve years apart. They had found each other again in London some three months previously at a dinner at the American Embassy. When she'd caught sight of him, her smile had been like a red rose pinned on her widow's mourning. She had talked to him, shyly yet frankly, of her marriage to Fraser Leith and of her subsequent life in France, where her husband's mother, left a widow in his youth, had been remarried to the Marquis de Chantel. She had spoken also with an intense eagerness of affection of her little girl, Effie, who was now nine years old, and in a strain hardly less tender of Owen Leith, the charming, clever young stepson whom her husband's death had left to her care. He had once or twice run across the man whom Anna Summers had preferred to him, and since he had met her again, he had been exercising his imagination on the picture of what her married life must have been. Her husband, she told him, had devoted himself with religious seriousness to the collection of enameled snuff-boxes. Their next meeting was in an old country house in the soft landscape of southern England. Mrs. Leith, on this occasion, was no less kind than before, but she contrived to make him understand that what was so inevitably coming was not to come too soon. She seemed to wish not to miss any stage in the gradual reflowering of their intimacy. Darrow, for his part, was content to wait if she wished it. And they did, in fact, see each other in London. She was preoccupied with, as she phrased it, frocks and governesses for her little girl who had been left in France. Nevertheless, during her brief escapes from duty, Darrow had had time to feel her safe in the custody of his devotion, set apart for some inevitable hour, and the last evening at the theatre, between the overshadowing marquise and the unsuspicious stepson, they had had an almost decisive exchange of words. Unexpected obstacle. Please don't come till 30th. The 30th, and it was now the 15th. She flung back the fortnight on his hands as if he had been an idler indifferent to dates instead of an active young diplomatist who, to respond to her call, had had to hew his way through a very jungle of engagements. Please don't come till 30th. Not the shadow of an excuse or a regret, not even the perfunctory have-written with which it is usual to soften such blows. She didn't want him and had taken the shortest way to tell him so. If I asked her to marry me, she'd have refused in the same language, but thank heaven I haven't, he reflected. She might at least have advised him by telegraphing directly to his rooms. But in spite of their exchange of letters, she had apparently failed to note his address, and a breathless emissary had rushed from the embassy to pitch her telegram into his compartment as the train was moving from the station. This minor proof of her indifference became, as he jammed his way through the crowd, the main point of his grievance against her and of his derision of himself. He thanked his stars that he need not plunge to no purpose into the fury of waves outside the harbour, he would take the next train up from Dover. With this thought in his mind, he turned back to look for his porter, and as he did so, a descending umbrella caught him in the collarbone. Oh, dear, oh, dear! And the next moment, 
Bent sideways by the wind, it turned inside out and soared up kite-wise at the end of a helpless female arm. Oh, it's in ribbons. Here's mine if you want it. Why, it's Mr. Darrow. Oh, thank you. We'll share it if you will. Wait here. I'll find my porter. Oh, please, I can't find my trunk. You've lost a trunk. Let, let me see if I can find it. Not a trunk, but my trunk. I've no other. You better first see to getting your own things on the boat. I don't actually know that I'm going over. She knew him, and he knew her, but how and where had they met? Allow me. So pleasant a vision as that gleaming up at him between wet brown hair and wet brown boa should have evoked only associations as pleasing. But each effort to fit her image into his past resulted in a memory of boredom and a vague discomfort. Don't you remember me now? They had taken shelter in a quiet coffee room. At Mrs. Moretz. Oh, Mrs. Moretz. Was it there? That awful house in Chelsea. Oh, the taste of stale follies. I used to pass you on the stairs. Yes. He had seen her slip by. He recalled it now. How could such a face with the boyish elf lock and the ear that was meant to have a rose behind it, have been merged in the Murret mob. But of course you wouldn't remember me. My name is Viner, Sophie Viner. You're Mrs. Moret's niece? No, not even that. Only her reader. Do you mean to say she ever reads? <laughs> Dear, no. But I wrote notes and made up the visiting book and walked the dogs and saw bores for her. That must have been rather bad. <laughs> Yes, but nothing like as bad as being her niece. That I can well believe. I'm glad to hear that you put it all in the past tense. Yes. All is at an end between us. We've just parted in tears. But not in silence. Do you mean to say you've been there all this time? Ever since you used to come there to see Lady Eureka? Does it seem so awfully long ago? Oh, you don't like my saying that you came for Lady Eureka. <laughs> it's better than you're thinking I came for Mrs. Moret. <laughs> we all used to wonder about you. What about me? Well, uh, whether it was you or she who... Well, Mrs. Bolt and the Countess naturally thought it was she, but Jimmy Brantz, especially Jimmy... Who on earth is Jimmy Brantz? But how could you? She was false from head to foot. False? You think I'm spiteful and envious? Yes, I was envious of Lady Eureka. Oh, not on account of you or Jimmy Brantz, simply because she had almost all the things I've always wanted. Clothes and fun and motors and admiration and yachting and Paris. Why, Paris alone would be enough. And how do you suppose a girl can see that sort of thing about her day after day and never wonder why some women who don't seem to have any more right to it have it all tumbled into their laps. While others are writing dinner invitations and copying visiting lists and finishing golf stockings. One looks in one's glass after all. That's the kind of education I got at Mrs. Moretz, and I never had any other. Were you there so long? Five years. I stuck it out longer than any of the others. Well, thank God you're out of it now. Yes. And what... If I may ask, are you doing next? I'm going to Paris to study for the stage. The stage? Uh, then you will have Paris, after all. <laughs> Hardly Lady Eureka's Paris. Have you any any influence you can count on? <laughs> None but my own. But have you any idea how the profession is overcrowded? I have a very clear idea. But I couldn't go on as I was. No, of course not. But since, as you say, you'd stuck it out longer than any of the others, couldn't you at least have held on until you were sure of some kind of an opening? The truth is, we quarreled. And I left last night without my dinner. And without my salary. Ah. And without a character. And without a trunk, as it appears. But didn't you say that before going, there'd be time for another look at the station? There was time for another look at the station, but the look again resulted in disappointment. The fact caused Miss Viner a moment's perturbation, but she promptly adjusted herself to the necessity of proceeding on her journey. 
and her decision confirmed Darrow's vague resolve to go to Paris instead of retracing his way to London. Miss Viner seemed cheered and sustained by his offer to telegraph to Charing Cross for the missing trunk. The inquiry dispatched, he was turning away from the desk when another thought struck him, and he went back and indicted a message to his servant in London. If any letters with French postmark received, forward immediately to Terminus Hotel, Gardenor, Paris. Almost as soon as the train left Calais, her head had dropped back into the corner and she had fallen asleep. Sitting opposite in the compartment from which he had contrived to have other travelers excluded, Darrow looked at her curiously. The story she had imparted to him in the wheezing, shaking cabin and at the Calais buffet, where he had insisted on offering her the dinner she had missed at Mrs. Murritz's, had given a distincter outline to her figure. From the moment of entering the New York boarding school to which a preoccupied guardian had hastily consigned her after the death of her parents, she had found herself alone in a busy and indifferent world. Somewhere there was an elder sister, Laura, married, unmarried, remarried, absorbed by her pursuit of some vaguely artistic ideal. The guardian then died, the confusion of his financial affairs taking her inheritance with him and plunging her into the wide, bright sea of life. After an interval of repose with compassionate but impecunious American friends in Paris, Miss Viner had been drawn into the turbid current of Mrs. Murrett's career. The Farlows, she explained to Darrow, were the most incorrigibly inexperienced angels, and quite persuaded that Mrs. Murrett was a woman of great intellectual eminence, and the house at Chelsea the last of the salons. The rush into Amiens and the flash of the station lights into their compartment broke Miss Viner's sleep, and without changing her position, she lifted her lids and looked at Darrow. There was neither surprise nor bewilderment in the look. She seemed instantly conscious, not so much of where she was, as of the fact that she was with him. And that fact seemed enough to reassure her. We shall be in before midnight. We're very nearly on time. I telegraphed Mrs. Farlow that they mustn't think of coming to the station. But they'll have told the concierge to look out for me. You'll let me drive you there. The swaying of the train had loosened a lock of hair over her ear, and she shook it back with a movement like a boy's. It was very pleasant. How differently Anna Leith would have behaved. She would have waked with a start, wondering where she was, and how she had come there, and if her hair were tidy, and nothing short of hairpins and a glass would have restored her self-possession. Darrow felt an intense desire to lean forward and put the lock of hair back behind her ear. As their motor cab, on the way from the Gardenor, turned into the central glitter of the boulevard, Darrow had bent over to point out an incandescent threshold. There. Above the doorway, an arch of flame flashed out the name of a great actress. Sir Dean! Is that where she acts? It's delicious enough just to know she's there. I've never seen her, you know. Well, you must come with me tomorrow evening to see the play. With your friends, of course. That is, if there's any sort of chance of getting seats. Oh, will you really take us? Oh, it's too beautiful of you. Oh, don't you think you'll be able to get seats? It was wonderfully pleasant to be able to give such pleasure. There floated through his mind an answer of Mrs. Leith's to his inquiry whether she had seen the play in question. No, I, I meant to, of course, but one is so overwhelmed with things in Paris... And then one is always being dragged to see Sardine. 
This little passage came back to him the next morning as he opened his hotel window on the early roar of the northern terminus. The girl was there, in the room next to him. When they had reached the Farlows' door in the Rue de la Chaise, it was only to find that the Farlows were no longer there. The Farlows had gone to Joigny. To pursue them there at that hour was manifestly impossible, and Miss Viner had quite simply acceded to Darrow's suggestion that she should return for what remained of the night to the hotel where he had sent his luggage. It was the kind of episode that one might, in advance, have characterized as awkward. Yet that was proving, in the event, as much outside such definitions as a sunrise stroll with a dryad in a dew-drenched forest. It had been understood that the next morning he was to look up the Joigny trains and see her safely to the station— but he recalled again her cry of joy at the prospect of seeing Sardine. Having dressed, he decided to carry the result of his deliberations to his neighbor's door. It instantly opened at his knock. Well, what do you think of me? I think the missing trunk has come and that it was worth waiting for. <laughs> no, 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 no. My trunk hasn't come, and this is only my old dress of yesterday. But I never knew the trick to fail. Trick? Of spinning around like this and saying to everyone, well, what do you think of me? And do you know, they're always, always taken in. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but this confirms your vocation, of course. You must see Sardine. Seeing her face fall... At this reminder of the change in her prospects, he hastened to set forth his arguments against a hasty pursuit of her friends. Yes, it would certainly be foolish, she at once agreed, to dash off after the Farlows without more positive proof that they were so established at Joigny that they could take her in. Point by point she fell in with the suggestion, but met his proposal that they should drive back to the Rue de la Chaise by the declaration that it was a waste not to walk in Paris. So they set off on foot. Paris shone in morning beauty under a sky that was all broad, wet washes of white and blue. Her delight in the fresh air and motley brightness of the scene gave Darrow a sudden insight into her stifled past. Years of repression were revealed in her sudden bursts of confidence, and the pity she inspired made him long to fill her few free hours to the brim. In the Rue de la Chaise, they learned little except the exact address of the Farlows. This information obtained, Darrow proposed to Miss Viner that they should stroll along the quays to a little restaurant looking out on the Seine, and there, over the Plat de Jour, consider the next step to be taken. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> the dishes resemble the way the people talk. They do. Darrow, as he watched her enjoyment, wondered if her vividness and vivacity were signs of her calling. Oh, but I must telegraph at once. You could hardly get an answer to your telegram in time to take a train to Joigny this afternoon. Why not try a letter? Darrow called for writing materials. In the throes of invention, she had pushed back her hat, loosening the stray lock which had invited his touch the night before. I wish I weren't such an idiot about writing. All the words get frightened and scurry away when I try to catch them. He thought of Anna Leith's letters. He saw the slender, firm strokes of the pen, and by an abrupt association of ideas, remembered that at that very hour just such a document might be awaiting him at the hotel. What if it were there, indeed, and had brought him a complete explanation of her telegram? What if it were calling him to her side at once? The revulsion of feeling produced by this thought made him look at Miss Viner with sudden impatience. How he could have wasted half his day with her when all the while Mrs. Lee's letter might be lying on his table. There was really no excuse for his having blundered into such an adventure. Paris was full of people he knew. And what if some friend of Mrs. Lee's should see him at the play with a suspiciously good-looking companion? At the porter's desk, a brief 
pas de lettre, fell destructively on the fabric of his hopes. Mrs. Leith had not written. She had not taken the trouble to explain her telegram. Darrow turned away with a sharp pang of humiliation. At the theater, Sophie Viner sat intent in her corner of their baignoire. After the first act, she remained rapt and motionless. When the second act was over, Darrow suggested they're taking a turn in the foyer. But they're giving a deep tomorrow afternoon at the Francais. I suppose you've seen it heaps and heaps of times. You must see it too. We'll go tomorrow. How can I? The last train for Joigny leaves at four. A twinge of compunction shot through him. Though she had given him her letter to post, it was still in the pocket of the coat he had taken off when he dressed for dinner. Oh, come, come, we mustn't miss it. Glancing back from the doorway of their box, above the faces of the Parisian crowd, he caught the fresh, fair countenance of Owen Leith, signaling a joyful recognition. The young man, slim and eager, had detached himself from two companions and was seeking to push through the press to his stepmother's friend. Sophie, as if instinctively warned, melted back into the shadow of their box. I was sure it was you. <laughs> Such luck to run across you. Oh, won't you come off with us to supper after it's over? Uh, Montmartre? Or wherever else you please. And... Uh... We'd be so glad. For half a second, Darrow read in his hospitable eye the termination, if you'd bring the lady, too. We'd all be so glad if you'd come. Darrow excused himself with thanks, and young Leith left him with the friendly question, We'll see you at Givray later on? When he rejoined Miss Viner, Darrow's first care was to find out, by a rapid inspection of the house, whether Owen Leith's seat had given him a view of their box. But the young man was not visible from it, and Darrow concluded that he had been recognized in the corridor and not at his companion's side. His sense of reassurance was less due to regard for Miss Viner than to the persistent vision of grave, offended eyes. During the drive back to the hotel, this vision was persistently kept before him by the thought that the evening post might have brought a letter from Mrs. Leith and Darrow could hardly wait to ascend to his room. Upstairs, Sophie paused on her threshold, gathering up in one hand the pale folds of her cloak, while she held the other out to Darrow. If the Farlow's telegram comes early, I shall be off by the first train. So, I suppose this is goodbye. With a renewed start of contrition, Darrow perceived that he had again forgotten her letter, and as their hands met, he vowed to himself that the moment she had left him, he would dash downstairs to post it. As he lifted the hand to his lips, a tremor of pleasure crossed her face. Without even waiting to see her pass into her room, he unlocked his door. The light showed him a telegram on the table. No letter from France, the message from his servant read. Darrow dropped into a chair and sat gazing at the dingy carpet. She had not written then, and it was manifest now that she did not mean to write. Her silence could mean only that she had no explanation to give, or else that she was too indifferent to be aware that one was needed. This will be goodbye then, she had said on their last evening in London, and it occurred to him that her parting phrase had been the same as Sophie Viner's. At the thought, he jumped to his feet and took down from its hook the coat in which he had left Miss Viner's letter. A sound in the next room made him pause. A few feet off, on the other side of a thin partition, a small, keen flame of life was quivering and agitating the air. The next day, Sophie had hardly attempted to conceal her satisfaction on finding that no telegram came from the Farlows. Her mind had flown on to the golden prospect of an afternoon at the Théâtre Francais. 
When the play was over, he would have liked to persuade her to drive directly to the Bois for dinner, but she wished first to go back to the hotel to see if the telegram was there. On her threshold, she met him with the expected. No, there's nothing. Do you happen to remember what time it was when you posted my letter? As she put the question, he entered the room and closed the door behind him. I'm sorry, so sorry, he said, taking her hands and pressing them together between his. I didn't post your letter. I didn't post it because I wanted so much to give you a few good hours, a few days to have all the things you've never had. It's not always May and Paris. Why not make the most of them now? You know me. We're not strangers. Why shouldn't you treat me like a friend? My designs were not nefarious. I saw you'd been through a bad time with Mrs. Moret and that there didn't seem to be much fun ahead for you. And the truth is, I just liked being with you. You made me forget my bothers. I didn't see why we shouldn't have a few hours together first, so I left your letter in my pocket. Are you unhappy, too? Forgive me. Do forgive me, but... Why on earth should we say goodbye if we're both sorry to? She hung before him like a leaf on the meeting of cross currents that the next ripple may sweep forward or whirl back. Do you want to know what I feel? that you're giving me the only chance I've ever had. Is it really going to happen to me? Her face, as she lifted it to his, looked so small and young that Darrow felt a fugitive twinge of compunction, instantly effaced by the excitement of the pursuit. <laughs> All day, since the late reluctant dawn, the rain had come down in torrents. It descended with the regularity of a third day's rain, streaking against Darrow's high-perched windows and reducing their vast prospect of roofs and chimneys to a black, oily huddle. He had drawn his armchair to the fire. The timetable he had been studying lay on the floor. The room was getting on his nerves. It was extraordinary with what a microscopic minuteness of loathing he hated it all. The grimy carpet, the black marble mantelpiece, the high-bolstered brown counterpaned bed, the frame card of printed rules, and the door of communication with the next room. He hated the door most of all. All he had ever meant to do was to give her a child's holiday to look back to, the rain had made all the difference. His cigar had gone out, and he threw it into the fire. A different noise aroused him. It was the opening and closing of the door leading from the corridor into the adjoining room. He sat motionless, his eyes closed. But now another sight forced itself under his lowered lids. It was the precise photographic picture of that other room. A step sounded on the floor, and he knew which way the step was directed, what pieces of furniture it had to skirt, where it would probably pause, and what was likely to arrest it. Then he heard the mouse-like squeal of a reluctant drawer, and knew it was the upper one in the chest of drawers beside the bed. The step crossed the floor again, drawing near the door of communication between the two rooms. For a moment there was silence. Then he heard a low knock. The step was in the room, coming cautiously toward him. He kept his eyes shut, relaxing his body to feign sleep. 
then the rustle of a dress behind his chair, the warmth of two hands pressed for a moment on his lids, the lingering scent of some stuff he had bought on the boulevard. He looked up and saw a letter falling over his shoulder to his knee. Did I disturb you? I'm so sorry. They gave me this just now when I came in. The letter slipped to the floor. It lay there, address upward at his feet. While he sat staring down at the slender, firm strokes of the pen, an arm reached out from behind him to pick it up. Don't. Don't what? He became aware that the face was leaning over him and that in a moment he would have to look up and kiss it. He bent forward first and threw the unopened letter into the middle of the fire. It was October, and the light of the afternoon lay on an old high-roofed house, which enclosed in its long expanse of brick and yellowish stone the breadth of a grassy court filled with the shadow and sound of limes. In the court, a lady stood. She held a parasol above her head and looked now at the house front, now down the drive toward the avenue of grass cutting through the wood. Mrs. Leith had come to meet her stepson, and she carried in her hand the letter which had sent her in search of him. But with her first step out of the house, all thought of him had been effaced by another series of impressions. The scene about her was known to satiety. She had seen Givray at all seasons of the year since the far-off day of her marriage. Now she was trying to see it through the eyes of an old friend, who the next morning would be driving up to it for the first time. The thrill of his letter gave a keener edge to every sense, as though a thin, impenetrable veil had suddenly been removed. Just such a veil, she now perceived, had always hung between herself and life. In her girlhood, when she had first met young Darrow, his passion had swept over her like a wind that shakes the roof of the forest. He was extraordinarily intelligent and agreeable, but he wanted to kiss her, and she wanted to talk to him about books and pictures. Whenever they were apart, a reaction set in, and she wondered how she could have been so cold, called herself a prude and an idiot, and got up in the dead of night to try new ways of doing her hair. But as soon as he reappeared... Her head straightened itself on her slim neck, and she flew her little kites of erudition. She was still quivering with bewilderment when Fraser Leith had appeared and presented her with a prettily bound anthology of the old French poets. It was only in the rare moments when Mr. Leith's symmetrical blonde mask bent over hers and his kiss dropped on her like a cold, smooth pebble that she questioned the completeness of the joys he offered. As she sat in the autumn sun, with Darrow's letter in her hand, the history of Anna Leith appeared to its heroine like some grey, shadowy tale that she might have read in an old book one night as she was falling asleep. Two brown blurs emerging from the farther end of the wood vista gradually defined themselves as her stepson and an attendant gamekeeper. She watched Owen's approach with a smile. From the first days of her marriage, she had been drawn to the boy. Her interest in him led her to think more often of his mother. The loneliness must have been awful if even Owen couldn't keep her from dying of it. She did not mean, if she could help it, that either Effie or Owen should know that loneliness or let her know it again. They were three now to keep each other warm. Is Darrow coming? Yes, I've just heard. He arrives tomorrow. Oh, you darling. <laughs> oh, Owen. <laughs> Owen. <laughs> he spun her round so that the late sun gleamed on her face.
It was the day after Darrow's arrival. They were seated on a bench by the river. Anna, silent, so intensely aware of Darrow's nearness that there was no surprise in the touch he laid on her hand. They looked at each other, and he smiled and said, There are to be no more obstacles now. What obstacles? Don't you remember the wording of the telegram that turned me back last May? Unforeseen obstacle, that was it. What was the earth-shaking problem, by the way? Finding a governess for Effie, wasn't it? But I gave you my reason. I explained the delay and asked you to come. And you never even answered my letter. It was impossible to come then. I had to go back to my post. And impossible to write and tell me so. Her heart trembled. She felt her happiness so near, so sure. But her very security urged her on. For so long her doubts had been knife-edged. Now they had turned to harmless toys that she could toss and catch without peril. You didn't come and you didn't answer my letter. And after waiting four months, I wrote another... And I answered that one, and I'm here. Yes, but in my last letter, I repeated exactly what I'd said in the first. I told you then that I was ready to give you the answer to what you'd asked me in London. And in telling you that, I told you what the answer was. My dearest, my dearest, I was hurt and unhappy, and I... (laughs) I doubted you. There's the whole pusillanimous truth of it. Oh, It's the whole truth. What can I tell you to make you sure? You can let me tell you everything first. Owen saw you in Paris. Oh, yes. So he did. I think you talked to him a moment in a theater. I asked if you'd sent me any message. He didn't remember that you had. In a crush, in a Paris foyer. It was absurd of me, yes, but Owen told me he hadn't had time to say much to you because you were in such a hurry to get back to the lady you were with. Yes. And what else did he tell you? Oh, not much. Except that she was awfully pretty. (laughs) He said you had her tucked away in a baignoire and he hadn't actually seen her, but he saw the tail of her cloak and somehow knew from that that she was pretty. One does, you know. I think he said the cloak was pink. (laughs) Of course it was. (laughs) They always are. So, that was at the bottom of your doubts. Not at first. I only laughed. But afterward, when I wrote you and you didn't answer... Oh, you do see. Yes, I see. It's not as if this were a light thing between us. If I thought that at that moment, when you were on your way here... Yes, I understand. But do you? I'm not a goose of a girl, I know. Of course I know. But there are things a woman feels when what she knows doesn't make any difference. It's not that I want you to explain. I mean, about that particular evening. It's only that I want you to have the whole of my feeling. To see me just as I am. With all my irrational doubts and scruples. I never dreamed I should say such things to you. I never dreamed I should be here to hear you say them. But now that you have, I know, I know. You know? That this is no light thing between us. Now you may ask me anything you please. That was all I wanted to ask you. For a long moment, they looked at each other without speaking. She saw the dancing spirit in his eyes turn grave and darken to a passionate sternness. He stooped and kissed her, and she sat as if folded in wings. It was in the natural order of things that on the way back to the house, their talk should have turned to the future. There seemed no reason why the marriage should not take place within the six weeks that remained of Darrow's leave. You're sure you're prepared to give up Givray? You look so made for each other. When Owen marries, I shall have to give it up. That's looking some distance ahead. I want to be told that meanwhile, you'll have no regrets. There will probably be no meanwhile. Owen may marry before long. Oh, why, he always seems like a fawn in flannels. <laughs> I hope he's found a dryad. 
There might easily be one left in these blue and gold woods. I can't tell you yet where he found his dryad, but she is one, I believe. Only there may be difficulties. Ah. Uh, your mother-in-law? It's not what she would call a good match. It's not even what I call a wise one. I've promised Owen that I'll prepare her for the news as soon as she comes back from Ushi. She knows the girl and likes her. That's our hope. I can't tell you more till I've told her. I've promised Owen not to tell anyone. All I ask you is to give me time, to give me a few days at any rate. You see, I couldn't bear it if the least fraction of my happiness seemed to be stolen from his. I want her life to be like a house with all the windows lit. Yet through the haze of bliss enveloping her... Owen's affairs seemed curiously unimportant and remote. Nothing really mattered but the torrent of light in her veins. In his room, Darrow threw himself into an armchair and mused. To be loved by a woman like that made all the difference. Two or three more years of diplomacy with her beside him, he felt modestly but agreeably sure of doing something. And under this assurance was the lurking sense that he was somehow worthy of his opportunity. His life, on the whole, had been a creditable affair. As for the private and personal side, it had come up to the current standards, and if it had dropped now and then below a more ideal measure, he had always remained strictly within the limit of his scruples. From this reassuring survey of his case, he came back to the contemplation of its crowning felicity. The well-being he felt in Anna's presence proved her to be the woman for him. He was thinking of her look, when she had questioned him about his meeting with Owen at the theatre, the reddening of her cheek, the way her eyes sought shelter and then turned and drew on him. Pride and passion were in the conflict, magnificent qualities in a wife. The sight almost made up for his momentary embarrassment at the rousing of a memory which had no place in his present picture of himself. She was the kind of woman with whom one would like to be seen in public. Yes, hang it, he suddenly exclaimed. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me anyhow. The next day, Owen returned to Givray with his grandmother, his stepsister Effie, and the new governess. Concerning Darrow, Madame de Chantal received her daughter-in-law's suitor with an affability which implied her knowledge and approval of his suit. Indeed, her awe of his diplomatic profession made her admit the necessity of Anna's consenting to an early marriage, and that she must follow him to the next appointment in South America. Effie, Darrow found exquisite. Leaving her at Givre would not be for long, and he was pleased to hear that they had at last found the perfect governess. "'Here he is!' Effie cried, scampering down the hall." As she caught his hand, he perceived that she was trying to draw him towards someone who had paused behind her in the doorway. The figure came forward, and Darrow, looking up, found himself face to face with Sophie Viner. They stood still, a yard or two apart, and looked at each other without speaking. As they paused there, a shadow fell across one of the terrace windows, and Owen Leith stepped whistling into the room. He looked extraordinarily light-hearted and happy. He, too, stopped short, and the three stood there motionless for a barely perceptible beat of time. During its lapse, Darrow's eyes had turned back from Owen's face to that of the girl between them. He had the sense that whatever was done, it was he who must do it, and that it must be done immediately. He went forward and held out his hand. How do you do, Miss Viner? How do you do? The next moment, he again became aware of steps behind him and knew that Mrs. Leith was in the room. To his strained senses, there seemed to be another just measurable pause before Anna said, looking gaily about the little group, 
Has Owen introduced you? This is Effie's friend, Miss Viner. Effie, still hanging on her governess's arm, pressed herself closer with a little gesture of appropriation, and Miss Viner laid her hand on her pupil's hair. Darrow felt that Anna's eyes had turned to him. I think Miss Viner and I have met already, uh, several years ago in London. I remember. How charming! Then we're all friends. But luncheon must be ready. The little procession moved down the two long drawing rooms, with Effie waltzing on ahead. Madame de Chantel and Anna had planned for the afternoon a visit to a remotely situated acquaintance, and Owen suggested that he and Darrow should betake themselves to a distant cupboard in the desolate request for pheasants. Darrow was not an ardent sportsman, but any pretext to get away from the house and not to be left to himself was acceptable. When he came downstairs, the motor was at the door, and Anna, swathing her hat in veils, turned at the sound of his step and smiled at him for a long, full moment. I'd no idea you knew Miss Viner. It came back to me, luckily, that I'd seen her two or three times in London several years ago. Uh, she was a secretary or something of the sort in the background of a house where I used to dine. He had been secretly practicing the phrase all through the interminable hour at the luncheon table. I'm so glad it turns out that you know her. Oh, no, it's rather exaggerated. We used to pass each other on the stairs. But do try and remember everything you can. As he tramped through the woods, snatches of his companion's talk drifted to him through the confusion of his thoughts. Yet all the while he heard the ceaseless trip-hammer beat of the question, What in God's name shall I do? To get back to the house and try to speak to her before Anna's return seemed his most pressing necessity. Finally, toward four, he told his companion that he had some letters on his mind and must get back to the house and dispatch them before the ladies returned. In the dimness of the hall, he saw Sophie Viner standing by the door in her hat and jacket. She stopped at sight of him, and they stood for a second without speaking. Have you seen Effie? She went out with her nurse to meet you. No, but she will find her brother. Won't you come into the study and have a little talk? Everyone's out. At luncheon she had sat with her back to the window, and beyond noting that she had grown a little thinner and had less vivacity, he had seen no change in her. But now, as the lamplight fell on her face, its whiteness startled him. You promised to let me hear from you now and then. There was nothing to tell. I've had no history, like the happy countries. You are happy here? I was. I'm sure you're not thinking of going. There can't be kinder people anywhere. I suppose it depends on you, whether I go or stay. On me? What? Good God, what can you think of me to say that? Don't imagine I'm the least bit sorry for anything. You've been here, then, ever since? Since June, yes. Your idea of the theatre, you gave that up at once, then? I had to take the first thing that offered. Well, I'm glad, extremely glad you're happy here. <clears throat> I'd, I'd counted on you letting me know if there was anything I could do. Uh, the theatre now, if, if you're not contented here, I know people in that line in London. Then you do want me to leave. Good heavens, how can you think such things? Ever since, I've been wanting to be of use, to do something, anything to help you. Then you can help me to stay here. Through the stillness of the pause which followed... The bray of a motor horn sounded far down the drive. Instantly she turned, with a last white look at him, and fled from the room and up the stairs. He stood benumbed by the shock of her last words. She was afraid, then. Afraid of him. Poor thing. Poor thing, he could only go on saying.
In the oak room, he found Mrs. Leith, her mother-in-law, and Effie, the group composed prettily about the tea table. Anna rose at his entrance. Stop a minute in my sitting room on your way up. She will want to ask me about the girl, Darrow repeated to himself. From her writing table, where she sat over a pile of letters, Anna lifted her happy smile. He felt the sweep of the secret tides, and all his fears went down in them. She moved to the sofa corner by the fire, and he drew an armchair close to her. I want you to tell me about Miss Viner. It's important, naturally, that I should find out all I can about her before I leave. On Effie's account? Of course. But you've every reason to be satisfied, haven't you? We all like her, and Effie's very fond of her, but we know so little, after all, about her antecedents, I mean, and her past history. That's why I want you to try and recall everything you heard about her when you used to see her in London. Well, I'm afraid I shan't be of much use. As I told you, she was a mere shadow in the background of the house I saw her in, and that was four or five years ago. When she was with a uh, Mrs. Moret? Yes, an appalling woman who runs a roaring dinner factory that used now and then to catch me in its wheels. Then you never really saw anything of her there? I never had the chance. Mrs. Moret discouraged any competition on the part of her subordinates. Especially such pretty ones, I suppose. Yeah, but surely you could have found out about her from the people through whom you first heard of her. Oh, we heard of her through Adelaide Painter. Adelaide is a spinster of South Braintree, Massachusetts, who came to Paris some 30 years ago. Madame de Chantel places great reliance on her judgment. Well, then, if South Braintree vouches for Miss Viner... Oh, but only indirectly. I'm not conscious of ever having heard anyone say two words about her. I only infer that she must have pluck and character to have stuck it out so long at Mrs. Moritz. Yes, poor thing. You don't know how glad I am that your impression is on the whole so good... I particularly wanted you to like her. On that condition, I am prepared to love even Adelaide Painter. I almost hope you won't have the chance to, poor Adelaide. Her appearance here always coincides with the catastrophe. Well, then I must manage to meet her elsewhere. Oh, what does anything matter but just this? My love. Oh, my dear love. A knock on the door made them draw apart. Sophie Viner entered. Seeing Darrow, she drew back, a quick red in her cheeks. Do come in, Miss Viner. I'm so sorry, but Effie has mislaid her Latin grammar, and I thought she might have left it in here. I need it to prepare for tomorrow's lesson. Is this it? Oh, thank you. He held it out to her. And as she took it and moved to the door, her blush deepened. Do excuse my disturbing you. You didn't disturb me. Darrow perceived that Anna was looking intently at the girl, while Sophie Viner's glance, making a swift circuit of the room, dwelt for an appreciable instant on the intimate propinquity of armchair and sofa corner. Then she turned back to the door. Till late in the night... Darrow's thoughts revolved in a turmoil of indecision. He was not much afraid of accidental disclosures. Both he and Sophie Viner had too much at stake not to be on their guard. The fear that beset him was of another kind and had a profounder source. He wanted to do all he could for the girl, but the fact of having had to urge Anna to confide Effie to her was peculiarly repugnant to him. Beat about the case as he would, it was clear that he owed it to Anna, and incidentally to his own peace of mind, to find some way of securing Sophie Viner's future without leaving her installed at Givray when he and his wife should depart for their new post. He must obtain from Miss Viner the chance of another talk, and he resolved to seek it at the earliest hour. <laughs>
Darrow found Miss Viner seated near the stone-rimmed basin beside which he and Anna had paused on their first walk to the river. With one of her disconcerting flashes of astuteness, she laid the case before him. You've known Mrs. Leith a long time? She told me you were friends. Great friends. Yes, we're great friends. Then you might naturally feel yourself justified in telling her that you don't think I'm the right person for Effie. I don't say that you'd like to do it. You're too various, too gifted, too personal to tie yourself down at your age to the dismal drudgery of teaching. And is that what you've told Mrs. Leaf? I've told her exactly nothing. And what exactly do you mean by nothing? You and she were talking about me when I came into her sitting room yesterday. I've told her simply that I'd seen you once or twice at Mrs. Moret's. And not that you've ever seen me since. And not that I've ever seen you since. And she believes you. She completely believes you. Well, I... Oh, I beg your pardon. I... I didn't mean to ask you that. Ah. Oh. Then thank you, and let me relieve your fears. I shan't be Effie's governess much longer. You really do agree with me, then? I'm not thinking of the stage. I've had another offer. That's all. You'll tell me about that, then, won't you? Oh, you'll hear about it soon. I must catch Effie now and drag her back to the blackboard. I've been odious to you and, and not quite honest. Not quite honest? I mean in seeming not to trust you. It's come over me again as we talked that at heart I've always known I could. Her color rose in a bright wave and her eyes clung to his for a swift instant of reminder and appeal. For the same space of time, the past surged up in him confusedly. Then a veil dropped between them. Here's Effie now, she exclaimed. He turned and saw the little girl trotting back to them, her hand in Owen Leith's. Even through the stir of his subsiding excitement, Dara was at once aware of the change effected by the young man's approach. For a moment, Sophie Viner's cheeks burned redder. Then they faded to the paleness of white petals. But her observer was less struck by this than by the corresponding change in Owen Leith. What did it signify? The morning mists turned to rain. Effie, with her governess, had been dispatched in the motor to do some shopping at Franchoy. Anna had promised Darrow to join him later in the afternoon for a quick walk. Anna sat in her sitting room, alone, her hands crossed on her knees, a smile on her face as she recalled the happy picture she had seen that morning from the terrace. Her child, her stepson, her promised husband, the three beings who filled her life. She was roused by the sound of Owen's step in the gallery. As the door closed behind him, she was struck by his look of pale excitement. You've come to ask me why I haven't spoken to your grandmother. I've spoken to her myself. When? Just now. I left her to come here. You asked me to help you, and I promised you I would. I was waiting and watching for the right moment. So was I. That's why I've spoken. And it was just what one expected. She takes it so badly, you mean? All the heavy batteries were brought up. My father, Givray, Monsieur de Chantal. Even my poor mother was dragged out of oblivion and armed with imaginary protests. Well, you were prepared for all that. I thought I was, till I began to hear her say it. Then it sounded so incredibly silly that I told her so. Oh, Owen. Yes, I know. But I couldn't help it. And you've mortally offended her, I suppose. That's exactly what I wanted to prevent. You tiresome boy, not to wait and let me speak for you. What were your reasons for waiting? My dear? Oh, it's all a tangle, isn't it? That's why I didn't think at all, but just suddenly blurted the thing out. 
And now she means to send for Adelaide Painter. Perhaps it's really the best thing for us all. It's too preposterous and humiliating, dragging that woman into our secrets. This could hardly be a secret much longer. You haven't, of, of course, spoken of it to anyone. You've not said a word to him. To Mr. Darrow? No. You're sure that nothing you've said to Darrow could possibly have given him a hint? Nothing I've said to him, certainly. And what on earth, my dear boy, can you be driving at? I don't know. I want to find out. Here he is. You can ask him yourself. Am I too soon? Is our walk given up? No, I was just going to get ready, but there's something we want to tell you first. Owen is engaged to Miss Viner. When Darrow that night regained his room, he reflected with a flash of irony that each time he entered it, he brought a fresh troop of perplexities to trouble its serene seclusion. But nothing as yet had approached the blank misery of mind with which he now set himself to face the fresh questions confronting him. One feeling alone was clear and insistent in him. He did not mean, if he could help it, to let the marriage take place. No wonder she had been sick with fear on meeting him. When at last he fell asleep, he had fatalistically committed his next step to the chances of the morrow. The first that offered itself was an encounter with Mrs. Leith. She had come down already hatted and shod for a dash to the park lodge where one of the gatekeeper's children had had an accident. As they hastened together through the drizzle, Anna drew close under his umbrella, and at the pressure of her arm against his, he recalled his walk up the Dover Pier with Sophie Viner. The memory gave him a startled vision of the inevitable occasions of contact, confidence, familiarity which his future relationship to the girl would entail, and the countless chances of betrayal that every one of them involved. Anna, why are you so anxious for this marriage? Why? But surely I've explained to you, or rather, I've hardly had to. You seem so in sympathy with my reasons. I didn't know then who it was that Owen wanted to marry. Why don't you think her a good match for Owen? Is it the fact that she's been Mrs. Moret's secretary? For as far as Owen and I can make out, this is the gravest charge against her. Still, one can understand that the match is not what Madame de Chantel had dreamed of. Oh, perfectly. If that's all you mean. The lodge was in sight. At the gate, she went in, leaving Darrow waiting outside to learn if she had any message to send back to the house. And after the lapse of a few minutes, she came out again. The child, she said, was badly, though not dangerously hurt and the village doctor, who was already on hand, had asked that the surgeon already summoned from Franchoy should be told to bring with him certain needful appliances. Owen had started by motor to fetch the surgeon, but there was still time to communicate with the latter by telephone. The doctor, furthermore, begged for an immediate provision of such bandages and disinfectants as Givre itself could furnish, and Anna bade Darrow address himself to Miss Viner, who would know where to find the necessary things. You've forgotten your Macintosh. I shan't need it. Wouldn't it have been fairer when we talked together yesterday to tell me what I've just heard from Mrs. Leith? Fairer? If I'd known that your future was already settled, I should have spared you my gratuitous suggestions. I couldn't speak yesterday. I meant to have told you today. At the lodge, he waited while she went in. The child, Sophie told him, was doing well, but Mrs. Leith had decided to wait till the surgeon came. As they walked back in silence, Sophie had accepted the shelter of his umbrella, but she kept herself at such a carefully measured distance that even the slight swaying movements produced by their quick pace did not once bring her arm in touch with his. And noticing this, he perceived that every drop of her blood must be alive to his nearness. What I meant just now was that you ought to have been sure of my good wishes to trust me a little farther than you did. I've told you that yesterday I, I wasn't free to speak. Well, since you are now, may I say a word to you? I can't think what you can have to say. It's not easy to say here, at any rate, and indoors I... 
I shan't know where to say it. But, um, let's walk over to the spring house for a minute. Sophie followed him without comment. I can't think what you can have to say. Have you nothing to say to me? About my marriage? What can I say that Mrs. Leith has not already told you? Mrs. Leith has told me nothing whatever but the fact and her pleasure in it. Well, aren't those the two essential points? The essential points to you? I should have thought. Oh, to you, I meant. The essential point to me is, of course, that you should be doing what's really best for you. Do you think my engagement to Mr. Leaf not really best for me? I'm not sure of its being the best thing for either of you. From whose point of view do you speak? Naturally, that of the person's most concerned. From Owen's, then, of course. You don't think me a good match for him? From yours, first of all. I don't think him a good match for you. She lifted her lids just far enough for a veiled glance at him, and a smile slipped through them to her trembling lips. For a moment, the change merely bewildered him. He's too young and inexperienced to give you the kind of support you need. He's a boy. A charming, wonderful boy, but with no more notion than a boy how to deal with the inevitable daily problems. I'll deal with them for him. They'll be more than ordinarily difficult. Well, you must have some special reason for saying so. Only my clear perception of the facts. What facts do you mean? You think I've no right to marry him? No right? God forbid! No, I only meant... That you'd rather I didn't marry any friend of yours. I'll tell you exactly what I meant. You'll be wretched if you marry a man you're not in love with. Darrow knew the risk of misapprehension that he ran but he estimated his chances of success as precisely in proportion to his peril. If certain signs meant what he thought they did, he might yet, at what cost he would not stop to think, make his past pay for his future. You're mistaken. You're quite mistaken in thinking what you think. I'm as happy as if I deserved it. Now, are you satisfied? She stood up and moved toward the door, turning her vividest face to him from the threshold. Down the avenue there came to them the voice of Owen's motor. Instinctively they drew apart at the sound. Without a word, Darrow turned back into the room, while Sophie Viner went down the steps and walked back alone toward the court. <laughs> 